I just want to say, right, right from the start, I'm super excited to be here today. Um, you know, it's been, it's been such a long time between these kind of phosphogy events happening down here in, in the Oceania region. Um, and just to have things happening and this like momentum and this excitement in my home country, it's like, oh, I don't know, it makes me super proud, I guess. Um, and, and just excited to see where, where we go from here. Uh, especially with this awesome turnout as well. Um, and actually, I'm also, I'm also kind of excited to be presenting to a home ground where people will hopefully get my sense of humour and that sort of Australian, you know, <laughs> bent on it. I just think, uh, like, too long, the, the distribution of open source adoption has, uh, or exception, acceptance, sorry, has looked a bit too much like this, where it's basically concentrated in that kind of European area. Uh, not so much happening down here in Oceania, but you know, I, I sense that there's a, a real shift in that mentality, and I think we're, we're almost at a breaking point where, where that widespread acceptance and just uh, trust in open source software is, um, you know, is at that breaking point. And definitely, like, the turnout for things like today is, is, is evidence of that. So today I'm going to talk about how we, as a, as a spatial community, can be strengthened by having a diversity of skill levels um, and how we can foster growth in our community by making it attractive to people from all these different skill levels. I want to start off by going through three stories. So I've got three stories from my kind of experience with the community and my, uh, my experience in sort of this you know, geospatial discipline, this geospatial field. <coughs> start with my first story. So my first story begins. It's my first year out of university. I'd studied uh, geomatics at RMIT. And at the time, I was working for Victoria Police as a, as a spatial analyst, the crime analyst for the spatial bank. Um, I was tasked with developing a, like a regression model for basically predicting the risk of uh, bushfire-related arson attacks across Victoria. Um, and you know, doing my research, I wanted to use R to do this because that was like a sort of recommended, you know, the recommended way of doing it. I would call myself at that stage, I was motivated, I knew what I wanted, but I was inexperienced. I didn't have the skills yet to be able to get to where I wanted to do. So motivated, but inexperienced. At the time, I, uh, you know, I, I hit a question that I needed an answer to, so I reached out to what uh, was the, like the relevant online community for that, um, for the, you know, that software package and that kind of uh, statistics discipline, which was this R help mailing list. To paraphrase the answer that I got to my question that I asked on there, this was basically the response that I got at the time. Was, if you don't already know the answer to this question, you shouldn't be doing this. It, it wasn't a pleasant exchange. <laughs> um, and I didn't get the answer that I was hoping for there. If I fast forward to 2018, so earlier this year, I, I, you know, the, the world is like a dramatically different place than when I asked that original question to the statistics forum way back then. You know, I don't think any of us would have predicted the, the change in the software environment, the sort of, you know, the just change in the global environment in general. Um, uh, so earlier this year, I had another occasion where I needed to reach out to a group of mathematical experts on the internet. Um, basically, the, the situation was a bit like this. I, I had this little math problem that I was trying to work out. I needed to solve it so I could you know, do some processing thing that I was trying to do. Where I wanted to know if I had a straight line between these two points and I had a curved line, what was the, the maximum, what was the biggest distance between those two points, basically, those two lines. Um, that's what I wanted to find out. Yeah, I kind of realised I didn't have the skills myself to be able to, to, to do that mathematics. So again, I reached out to a relevant community on the internet, maths.stackexchange.com. Uh, and I, you know, I spent the time trying to research and, and learn the right way that I could phrase my question in the language that they would be uh, familiar with, um, and just to kind of show that I was, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't just a student putting my homework up there, trying to hope someone else would do the work for me, but I'd at least put in some groundwork to, to, to come to their community on, on equal terms, at least, or trying to come to their community. Um, this was the answer that I got about half an hour after I posted this question. 
If you've learnt calculus, then that is the way to go. Or if I want to paraphrase that, it's, it's this answer again. If you don't already know the answer to this question, I'm not going to help you find it. Um, so my response was, run away, you know. <laughs> I haven't been back to Mass.Stock like Exchange since. Uh, that's my first story. I'm, I'm calling that story motivated but inexperienced. And I'm going to come back to that later. Story number two. So story number two. This is uh, my first year at university studying geomatics. Uh, during a class which was basically cartography studies. So I love this class. Like I, I, loved, I loved pretty maps. I loved you know, trying to make pretty maps. Um, and being able to study them uh, on a couple of days a week basis, it was awesome. It was like a dream come true. It's about three quarters of the way through that, that first semester at map making when the students, like myself included, we learnt enough to, to think we were experts. If you can imagine, you know, one semester, three quarters of the way through, probably not experts, but, but we thought we were. Um, and we got to class and it was a different type of lecture started. So basically what happened was that the, the lecturer started stepping through these slides of uh, what she classed as bad maps. And we, as student body, were basically asked to, to critique them and point out things that we thought were mistakes in those maps or flaws in those maps and try and learn through the mistakes that other people have made or by criticising other people's work. Um, I've seen this like time and time again, that this is basically like one of, you know, the cartographer, cartographer's favourite professions or, or pastimes is basically um, <laughs> criticising other people's work or, or critiquing other people's work. And there's, you know, all these blog, blogs and Twitter things and all this that are basically dedicated to, to pointing out the flaws in other people's maps. Um, and even today, this is, this is like my, it's so baked into my mentality that when I pick up a new map that someone else has made, like a travel map or something like that, the very first thing I do when I get that map is I start looking for the flaws in it. And I go through and I look at, you know, that label's badly placed, or that one's, you know, they didn't follow that, that should be blue, the convention, should be italic, that's the convention. Um, and it's just like in my psyche to, to just instantly start crit critiquing and basically sort of run through all these ways mentally that I could have made that map better. I'm going to call that story Critical Cartography. That was story number two. Right, my third story. This is uh, back in 2013. So 2013 was my first experience with the QGIS community. So I started using QGIS about that time. It was, it was version 1.8. Um, looked a little something like this. Being open source software and having a little bit of development experience in my background, I kind of quickly hit limits in what I wanted to get out of the software or hit bugs in it. Um, being open source, I had that power to extend it, um, so I wanted to. So I started making contributions and pushing in these little pull requests to fix things. This is a, a really similar story to, to Nathan Woodrow's, uh, if you saw Nathan's presentation yesterday. Um, Nathan was basically the guy who, who transitioned me into that community. Um, being motivated but inexperienced, I, I started emailing Nathan with my questions about how to how to solve different things. Um, so you know, I I'd, I'd hit a limit in the work I was trying to do, and I'd reach out to Nathan to say, "Can you help me here?" Uh, this almost became a daily occurrence that there was like these <laughs> things of me me pestering Nathan with with my questions about you know how to find my way around Git, how to find my way around the cutest code base, acceptable practices, all this kind of stuff. Uh, fortunately, he was a patient guy, so, <laughs> so I think if, if, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have been in the community from the start. Fast forward to 2018, guess what? It's still almost a daily occurrence <laughs> <laughs> that I'm sending Nathan questions asking him to help me out with my code. Uh, fortunately, it's a little bit of both ways now, so I can actually help him sometimes when he runs into problems. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, I can pay him back a bit. Um, I'm going to call that story mentor or mentee. Right, they're, they're my three stories. Here's my message that I want to get across to you. Is that by embracing a diversity of experience, we actually become a much stronger community. What I mean here is a diversity of experience being a community of users with a range of skills all the way from that level of, you know, rank beginner through to 
multi-year respected expert in the field. Why do I say this? Who here has seen this kind of catchphrase before? Spatial isn't special. It's kind of bandied around a bit. Um, nice catchphrase. I, I think a lot of the time, this, this is a little bit of a digression, but I think a lot of the time people say this and what they're actually trying to say is, you know, be careful not to stagnate and base your entire career on being a button pressing expert in one single dedicated GIS software program. It's not quite as catchy as spatial isn't special. So, so let's go with it. Spatial isn't special. I disagree. I think that spatial is inherently special. I think there is a lot of things in the, this in the spatial discipline that is unique to spatial. We've got so many problems we've got to deal with. We've got things like embellished geometries. We have things like data that crosses the anti-meridian. We have projections to deal with. We've got massive data sets, and we had massive data sets before big data was even a thing. We have all these kind of mathematical oddities like ellipsoids uh, and datum transformations. And now we even have things like dynamic time-based temporal datum transforms. And like, I, I honestly don't know how anyone who has you know, tried to get to grips with GDA 2020 could ever make a claim to say spatial isn't special. It, it's, you know, it's not possible. <laughs> so spatial is special, at least in my view, spatial is special. But the thing is, data science is special. Geotech is special. Environmental science is special. Web development is special. Database admin is special. Statistics is very special. <laughs> <laughs> All of these disciplines, they have a spatial component, but they come with their own body of domain-specific knowledge. And if we, as a community, recognise the value in these extra domain-specific areas of expertise, we can embrace and learn from those extra pieces of knowledge that are outside of our you know, spatial discipline. And I think, uh, you know, as, as the nature of, of like spatial, or traditional spatial roles kind of transitions from being like a, a GIS button presser in a desktop GIS package, We'll benefit more and more from having this, uh, this wide diversity of, of backgrounds. Just, to, just to, to break this down a little bit more, I, I, I'm kind of going to class new users to our community into two different groups. So to start with, we've got the, the Matteo Pellerons of the world. Um, I know him more as his Twitter and GitHub handle. And I can't even pronounce that, Mervyn, uh, sorry, so Matteo Pellerin. Matteo is, he lives in Cambodia, his background is pure and applied science, this is his own words, uh, followed by formal music studies at university, followed by a U-turn into the human rights field doing investigations and advocacy in Cambodia. So Matteo got onto mapping by necessity, he wasn't, he didn't study cartography, he didn't study uh, you know, spatial discipline at university. He started mapping because he needed it. He needed it for his job. So in 2006, this is one of the first examples of a map that, uh, that Matteo sent me. That's one of his first efforts. I would definitely class him at that stage as motivated but inexperienced. The thing with Matteo is that he, he reached out to the community. So he became involved in the QDIS project, like initially via filing bug reports. He filed many, many bug reports uh, on a, on a multi-report you know, multi a day basis, basically. Uh, he would send off his maps to, to other people to critique or to get constructive feedback on. Um, and then he started sending back these feature, feature requests to the QDIS project to say, hey, you know, I like your software but it's holding me back in this way. If it did this a little bit differently, or if it allowed me to do this, then I wouldn't be constrained by the limits of the software and I'd be able to make better maps as a result. And he actually became quite heavily involved in the QDIS project and he started contributing back to the project. So if I fast forward now to, to 2018, here's an example of one of his most recent maps. 
um, from a mainstream news channel. So he's now being published in, in mainstream media, basically. And the really cool thing is that he now is also one of the most prolific contributors to the QTIS code base. Uh, so you can see there, he's, as of the time I took this screenshot, he'd done over 700 commits to the project, probably up to about 750 by now. So that's Mateo. My, my second category of people who are new to the spatial discipline, we're going to call them the, the lazy cowboys. Um, and I, I'm keeping this anonymous, I don't want to put names on this. This is the sort of person who will get a data set in Web Mercator, uh, calculate the area based on that, and you know, that's their final result of the product. It works, it's not correct. Now, Lazy Cowboy is the sort of person who makes a map like this and thinks that that's, you know, that's acceptable for mainstream news channels. That actually was from news.com, but they use that map. The big thing is that inexperience is not the same as laziness. There's, there's no excuse for laziness, but inexperience can be forgivable. So if you're coming from a non-spatial background, it's your duty to learn about the spatial side of things. So it's, it's not acceptable to produce incorrect results and, and products which are misleading based on just this cowboy attitude. You know, spatial is special and you need to learn the ways that it's special and you need to learn the right ways to do things. The thing is that you know, the, the decision to be gatekeepers to this, this realm of spatial data, it's basically outside of our power to enforce. We, we can't control who uses our software, we can't control who uses our data, and we can't control the ways that they do that. So what should we do as a community of both spatial and non-spatial people to make sure that these motivated but inexperienced users have a nice transition into the spatial data community, or the spatial community? Quite simply, we need to make sure our community is accessible, welcoming and attractive to these people. To the motivated but inexperienced at least from those non-traditional GIS <coughs> backgrounds. We shouldn't become like the self-appointed gatekeepers and block these motivated but inexperienced people from our community. We want accessible, welcoming and attractive. So what practical steps can we take to achieve this? I've got, I've got four, uh, four of them that I've worked, in, at least in my experience, that I'm going to point out today. So the first off is become mentors or be mentored. Um, you know, mentoring is beneficial both ways. So by being mentored, I've gained a vast range of experience and skills in software development and computational geometry and C++, etc. But on the flip side, by mentoring people like human rights advocates and journalists, uh, environmental scientists, I've directly gained experience with their domain-specific body of knowledge uh, that now I'm able to utilise myself as well. Mentoring can be really fun as well, um, and it can be challenging, and it can basically push both the person who's mentoring and the person who's being mentored to extend themselves in, in new ways and learn new skills. So that's number one. Number two, and I'm, I'm directing number two specifically to people who are you know, established members of the spatial community. So this is not directed to the people who are new to the community. And that's that we need to shift this mentality from critical cartography to constructive cartography. We need to be really careful of critical wording in our reaction to other people's products. There's a thing called imposter syndrome. Um, I'm not sure if, if everyone here is aware of it, but Wikipedia's definition of imposter syndrome is it's a psychological pattern in which an individual doubts their accomplishments and has a persistent internalised fear of being exposed as a fraud. From Wikipedia. In my opinion, like imposter syndrome and these feelings of insecurity, they're, they're rife throughout our community. They're, it's like an epidemic, basically, in, in, this, in this spatial community. And I think the chances are that sometime at least once in your career, you'll experience that feeling yourself. I mean, I can definitely say I have myself as well. This is something we need to combat. Like, here's a really good example of this. Like, Linus Torvalds, this year, 2018, um, he's kind of like the poster child of like, a, abrupt, rude responses to people whose work he doesn't like on the internet. 
heaps of examples out there where he's like, ah, just, just fired off these, these tirades of people. Earlier this year, uh, here was a post he made on, an, on, a, on the Linux kernel mailing list. That he's going to take some time off and get some assistance on how to understand people's emotions and respond appropriately to them. So we need to recognise the constructive and destructive power of, of our words. My third point. Now this one is directed specifically to inexperienced but motivated people who are new to the community. And that's that you need to recognise your value. You have this domain specific knowledge that is incredibly valuable to the established members of the community. And that, that knowledge is basically essential to the growth and the future of, of spatial community as a whole. So you, you gotta recognize that. I mean, if you're here and, and you're feeling that way, like, I understand, you're, that, that extra knowledge you're bringing to the discipline, nobody else can provide that, it's, it's invaluable. My last point, number four. Um, this one is directed to everybody, both people who are established members of the community, people who are new to the community, or those, those inexperienced but motivated people who want to join the community. And that's to be inspired but not threatened. So, you know, who, who here has ever seen like viral maps on the internet or like some sort of cool new tech that someone's demonstrating or a visualization that new, new way of presenting data? And the first reaction when you see that is to feel threatened. Yeah. You know, I, I can definitely say myself, like I often see these and I, 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 my first thing thought is not, wow, that's cool, it's, I, could, I couldn't make that, I don't know how to make that. Am I expected to make that? Is that what the skills I need to actually have a career in the future in this discipline? Um, you know, that's my, my first gut feeling is that, it's fear basically. So we need to train ourselves to be inspired but not threatened by these you know, inspirational pieces of work. Um, and I've put train ourselves in bold there because this is like a rewiring of our thought process. It's, it's an ongoing thing. Like it's not, a, it's not something you can decide, yeah, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna be inspired, not threatened. It's, it's something you gotta continually work on. <sighs> I, the, the the second part to this is that it's, it can be incredibly challenging for us to step outside our kind of day-to-day -day routine where we're in our comfort zone, we're dealing with problems that we're confident in handling, um, and being exposed to this wider community and all these extra pieces of work that people are doing that we might not know about. You know, it, it's really confrontational to find out what's happening outside of our little daily bubble sometimes. So I just encourage, like, let, let inspiration be a source of motivation and not of fear. Um, if you, yeah, so in, in closing, you know, we're, we're here as a wider community of both users and contributors from across a whole range of backgrounds, a whole range of disciplines and skill levels. If you already feel like you're part of this community, um, this is the perfect opportunity to help grow that community. So, so you know, be inspired, be supportive, be constructive to people. Um, if they seek advice, give it freely. And if you're new to the community, if this is the first time that you're experiencing some event like this, just recognise your incredible worth. Um, reach out to people. Like if you see somebody presenting something really cool, go out and talk to them and, and chat to them afterwards. I, you know, I, I really doubt that you'll have a negative experience here and, and someone will close you off. More likely, you'll probably find yourself with a new mentor and a new channel that's going to help skill you both up. I'm pretty confident that you know, if we kind of embrace this diversity of skill levels in our community, we're going to shift, uh, you know, encourage that mindset, and we'll see more and more adoption of, of open source in, in Oceana and, and our Oceana uh, OpenStreetMap and Phosphor G communities will, will just grow and, fl and, and flourish, basically. Um, and we'll see more and more events like this in the future. So, that's good. Right? If we've got any questions from the audience, and, and I'll actually start. Um, one of the things that I've noticed about QGIS is how successful it is and how large its community has become and, and, and the success of that. 
Are, are there any observations you've had with the QGIS community, possibly comparing it to other communities? Well, what is it that you've seen in the QGIS community that might have led to this success? I, I think that like, the, the QGIS community was really blessed to have supportive people around from the beginning. So, so a lot of the early contributors were, were really open to... Um, to grow in that community, it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a, a closed community that was just releasing open source software. It was it was basically an open community, um, and and there's been like examples time and time again of, of people who are part of the community, kind of mentoring up new people to the community and bringing them in, and then those people branching off and spreading out. So, you know, if you saw Nathan's presentation yesterday, he was he was kind of mentored into the community by by Mark. I was mentored into the community by Nathan. I, you know, Nathan and myself in turn mentored Matteo into the community. Um, and I think it's just fortunate in many ways that right from the beginning it had a positive attitude, like a positive community, and yeah. that's just grown and made it flow and just made it flourish. Um, thank you for the talk. There are literally terabytes of open source and free planetary science data which has inspired generations of science and engineers. However, I've heard no talk in FOS4G or the um, talk yesterday afternoon about it, and yet it's free. Is, is this something that we can consider tapping into to inspire the next generation of um, spatial scientists, analysts and users? I would say definitely. <laughs> I think we all, we all like having access to more data. Um, and, you know, if, 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 that, if that absence in this community or in this event is due to us not reaching out to a certain uh, part of the community or a certain other discipline that's, that's currently siloed away and isolated, then that's something we should address, definitely. Quick question down the front here. Actually, sorry, if I can just add, add a bit of extra to that. I think one of the biggest problems we, we, we face in Oceania here at the moment as a spatial community is, is actually being able to communicate to the whole community. You know, like it's, it's quite easy for us to reach the same people again and again, and they're those people who are already part of the community, who are already, you know, actively kind of following the Twitter channels and the mailing lists and all that sort of stuff. But we're like, you know, the tip of the iceberg. We're like 0.1% of all the people out there in Australia and Oceania using spatial data, using, you know, the spatial data products. Um, and it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge of how do we reach that, that the rest of the community that, that should be here, you know, that would benefit from being here, that we would benefit from having them here as well. Thank you. Um, so my question's related to that, which is uh, what's... What's the best channel to have information about data sets that perhaps people can um, use with their work or find collaborators within the community to join projects? So if we've got a project that we'd like um, some assistance with, like, what's the best way for everyone to connect, do you think? Mm. I don't know if I have an easy answer there, to be honest. Uh, there, there is... There's a number of communities. So there's things like the QGIS Australia and QGIS New Zealand user groups. Uh, unfortunately, they're quite... That, you know, they're called QGIS user groups, so it, it, that's already cutting off a large part of the, the, the community. Um, oh, you know, I've, I've honestly found Twitter is, is, is one of the best ways to find out what other people are doing around the, the, um, you know, the, the country in that spatial data community. For some reason, we, we, it seems to have gravitated to, to that channel. And uh, I, I don't know of any other central central method. There's things like Stack Exchange and all that, but that, again, that's, they're global. They're not, not so much specific yeah, about Australian. Like. Yeah. Hmm. We, we I, think, I think we should definitely think about, <laughs> about setting up those channels, yeah. We've got time for one, one last question. Uh, you gave those two examples where you asked for help uh, about maths and you got a bad response and then years later you asked again and got a bad response. Yeah. Um, I think I've seen that get better in places like Stack Overflow over a similar time frame. So I think the quality of the questions is better, the quality of the answers is better. Do you see that as well or is it still really bad in maths? No, I was, I was like shocked actually when I got that response over the year because my experience is that, you know, Stack, my experience is basically on JS Stack Exchange and uh, um, Stack Overflow and that, where people are super helpful. You know, you, you, know, you see time and time again that somebody asks a question and you kind of look and you're like, man, that's like, I'm not going to help you with that. And then half an hour later, someone's written like this hundred line script that does their whole job for them. And you're like, okay, 
Um, so, so that, I reckon, is an anomaly. Like, a, I don't know if the whole math stack exchange community is like that, or that was just one bad, one bad response that kind of has, has soured my experience of that. But, but I guess the takeaway there is that, you know, one bad response is all it takes. So if, if that's your first experience with the community. Who wants to be part of our community? <laughs> um, we're, still, we're still going here. I, I think we'll take another no, question while we're... we're good oh, you good? You're good to go? Okay. Do you like this view or prefer the other one? Mm. Okay, uh, thank you very much.